people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Lipakshi Kurana with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Indian economy is blazing a trail of success that has outshined the world. It has emerged as an unrivaled champion, setting new benchmarks for its competitors and has crafted an economic model that has left everybody from the developed countries to the developing ones in its awe. From unprecedented revenue collections and discretionary spending to record surges in exports and FTI from attaining unparalleled infra development velocity to a sustained decrease in inflation indices, India is now reaping the benefits of a meticulously calibrated decisions in every aspect of the economy. A comprehensive report by U.S. financial services firm Morgan Stanley, how India has transformed in less than a decade, is spot on in its nuanced analysis of the Indian economy and has exuded confidence in her abilities to perform exceedingly well in the future too. What has India done that others haven't in order to reach where it is today? one of the coveted five economies of the world growing at the fastest rate? The most straightforward answer is almost everything. From strategizing long-term economic goals to effectively implementing reforms and measures, and from little tweaks for optimal results to complete overhauling of several frameworks, the brains behind the Indian economy have successfully delivered on both individual aspirations and the nation's progress. If you look at the annual data, annual data, as you rightly said, we have grown at 7.2%. The projection was 6.8%. We have again exceeded the projection. That is something very positive. Where are we exceeding? We have done well on exports. But the most important thing that we have done well on is on the gross fixed capital formation. From bringing mom and pop stores under the purview of the government, in line with successful efforts towards formalization of the economy. The Modi government took off with an aim to ensure the tax base of the country was widened and the people at the lower economic ladder received enough opportunities for upward financial movement. The formalization of the Indian economy ensured incentives, social security benefits, easy access to credit and financial services to those who complied, and a complete makeover of the business environment of the country. Businesses were deregulated and excessive bureaucratic measures and red tape were dealt a heavy blow. India has also done away with retrospective tax laws. India has cultivated a favorable environment for investors. India received a record 84.8 billion USD in foreign direct investment, including 7.1 billion in foreign direct investment equity inflows in the fiscal year of 2022. The government's visionary ideas and effective implementation have cumulatively positioned India on the path to achieving remarkable growth. Some of the results are already available for everybody to see. India's per capita income has witnessed a tremendous spike recently and is projected to grow to about 5,200 USD by 2032. The other thing about the Morgan Stanley report that I found really interesting was that the per capita income of an average Indian will rise 2.36 times, nearly two and a half times, in the next eight years. Morgan Stanley estimates the inflation in the country will remain benign and less volatile, which would pave an obstruction-free growth passage for the country. India's consumption basket is also increasing, and the country is fast moving towards discretionary spending. In an otherwise gloomy global scenario, uh, this we believe is an outcome of uh, structural reforms, uh, of supportive policies and uh, of course good governance uh, which has led to uh, India occupying its rightful place at the high table of global economies. 
The Indian approach has sparked a fresh sense of optimism among multinational corporations, which are looking towards the Indian market with great enthusiasm. From Apple Inc. to Google, major corporations across sectors are expanding their footprints in India. Some say India is likely to become the most attractive investment destination around the world in the near future. The country has already registered a significant leap in global rankings in terms of ease of doing business. The Indian market is thriving with a renewed vitality and the government is ensuring a sustained period of such economic growth, preventing any form of slowdown. Moving on, the two countries that could be referred to as all-weather allies in South Asian geopolitics are India and Nepal. With shared history, interest and ambitions, centuries-old cultural connect and a pure intent to help each other in development, the Indo-Nepal friendship has transcended all short and big obstacles. Top state-level visits, reciprocatory visits and a multi-led bilateral engagement has further propelled and accelerated their mutual advancement. Both Delhi and Kathmandu have time and time again iterated their commitment to consistently expand the scope of this bilateral dynamic that is no less than a model to emulate. Nepalese Prime Minister Pushp Kamal Dahel was in India last week to discuss deliberate and expand the nature of engagement between the two sides. India and Nepal, which observers refer to as permanent and natural allies, committed to strengthen their ties across sectors. India is one of Nepal's largest trading partners and has invested heavily in the fields of energy, manufacturing and tourism. India has also assisted Nepal in improving its capacity building. In our meeting today, we discussed the ways to further strengthen cooperation in diverse areas including trade, transit, investment, hydropower development, power trade, irrigation, agriculture, connectivity, including air entry routes, railways, bridge, transmission line, expansion of petroleum pipeline, construction of integrated check post, as well as cultural and people-to-people -people contact. Nepal and India have also been mulling enhancing connectivity between the two countries. The two countries might soon see opening of new air routes and reached a transit agreement. Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Dahel also unveiled e plate for integrated check posts of various cities connecting two neighbors. Today, transit agreement has been completed. In Nepal, the people of Nepal have been given to the new rail routes of inland water waste in India. We have given नए रेल लिंक स्थापित कर फिजिकल कनेक्टिविटी को बढ़ाने का निर्णय लिया। नेपाल वाज आल्सो वन ऑफ द फर्स्ट कंट्रीज टू अडॉप्ट इंडियाज यूनिफाइड पेमेंट इंटरफेस सिस्टम, टेकिंग इंस्पिरेशन फ्रॉम डिजिटल इंडिया, अ ग्रोइंग नंबर ऑफ कंट्रीज अराउंड द वर्ल्ड आर ट्रांसिशनिंग टू अ कन्वीनिएंट सिस्टम ऑफ कैशलेस पेमेंट। नेपाल हैज आल्सो जॉइंड द बैंडवैगन फाइनेंशियल कनेक्टिविटी में उठाए गए कदमों का हम स्वागत करते हैं इसका लाभ हजारों विद्यार्थी लाखों टूरिस्ट और तीर्थयात्रियों के साथ-साथ मेडिकल ट्रीटमेंट के लिए भारत आए मरीजों को भी मिलेगा तीन आईसीपी के निर्माण से आर्थिक कनेक्टिविटी सुदृढ़ होगी Two nations have decided to raise the amount of power exported from Nepal to India to 10,000 megawatts over the course of the following 10 years. Nepal intends to produce roughly 3,500 megawatts by next year in order to meet its domestic need of 2,000 megawatts while having the capacity to create up to 42,000 megawatts of hydropower. While China, another neighbor of Nepal, has been using all methods in book to gain and assert influence in the region, India, which is pro-people, 
Pro Development has been genuinely committed to the welfare of neighbors, has invested billions in Nepal in order to see a prosperous neighbor. Moving on, after leaving a number of smaller countries high and dry, China, the current villain in global politics, has now set its sights on Afghanistan, a war-torn South Asian country that has been facing increasing global marginalization owing to its appalling human rights track record. A prolonged stressed financial system has already resulted in widespread unemployment, economic deprivation and high inflation in Afghanistan. China has latched on to the opportunity to gain a foothold in the devastated country. From oil extraction to lithium deposits, China is eyeing Afghanistan's both untapped and underexplored reserves and facilities. The Taliban, finding itself with fewer allies by the day, is blindly following Beijing, disparate for some economic assistance. While China insists its interests in Afghanistan are truly altruistic, experts and observers insist there are other interests at play. Join us as we discuss China's increasing interest in Afghanistan and how their debt trap diplomacy can further impact a country already in shambles. Foreign ministers of China, Afghanistan and Pakistan recently met in Islamabad in furtherance of Beijing's unrelenting efforts to tap new investment avenues under its Belt and Road Initiative. Apart from discussing a host of regional issues including security, the three sides reach a unanimous agreement to further extend the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC, to Afghanistan. Observers believe that Beijing is seeking to exploit untapped natural resources in Afghanistan, which have an estimated value of over 3 trillion US dollars. The country is rich in resources like copper, gold, oil, natural gas, uranium, bauxite, coal, iron ore, rare earth, lithium, chromium, lead, zinc, gemstones, talc, sulfur, travertine, gypsum, and marble. Earlier in January of this year, the Taliban-led administration signed a contract with China's state-owned company, China National Petroleum Corporation, to extract oil from the Amu Darya Basin and develop an oil reserve in the Saripul province. An Afghan official spokesperson, Zabihullah Mujahim, said on Twitter that the Chinese company will invest $150 million a year in Afghanistan under the contract. Its investment would increase to $540 million in three years for the 25-year contract. As Western aid dries up in Afghanistan, this is a win-win situation for China, which has major plans to invest in various sectors, including exploring lithium reserves. They've initially promised an investment of $450 million, and in the first year, they plan to invest $150 million, and these are in oil fields. Afghanistan has some oil which is unable to extract with the Chinese will. Now, this is basically the China is testing waters in Afghanistan because Afghanistan has a lot of mineral reserves. Why has China been granted such easy access to Afghanistan's mineral reserves? According to the Brookings Institution, the Taliban's rule has progressively hardened and become more authoritarian and dogmatically like their reign in the 1990s. Individual rights have been emboweled, and women's access to education, jobs, and even the public sphere for travel and medical care has been decimated. This has led to the suspension of operations by major international humanitarian organizations in the country. Foreign aid has nearly all but dried up. Almost half of the Afghan population was projected to be acutely food insecure between November of 2022 and March of 2023, with 6 million on the brink of famine. The deteriorating economic situation in Afghanistan has forced the Taliban-led government to let Chinese investment into the country. Security is the most important issue that China is currently concerned about in Afghanistan, especially in the most remote of areas. 
Major Chinese investments have been targeted by the Islamic State Khorasan province and other terrorist groups. On December 12th of last year, just a day after the Chinese ambassador, Wang Yu, met with the Afghan Deputy Foreign Minister, Mohammad Abbas Stanaksai, about the security of Chinese investments, ISIS-K targeted a Chinese-owned hotel in Kabul, popular with Chinese nationals. Islamic jihadist groups, especially the ISIS-K, are targeting the Chinese for suppressing the Uyghur Muslim community and its imperialist policies like the Belt and Road Initiative. Although Chinese investment in Afghanistan is growing exponentially, the security of their citizens and workers remains to be a concern. Chinese are very much aware of the threats posed by ISIS to its projects. So in its, I believe that one of the things that Chinese would be expecting from the Taliban is to make sure there is a lot of political stability within Afghanistan and make sure that many of its projects are protected by uh, Taliban. According to Militant Wire, ISIS-K published an editorial in its Voice of Khorasan magazine last year, showing concern over Taliban-Beijing relations. The editorial even highlighted concerns on China's agenda of expansionism and colonization. Beijing is closely allying itself with Islamabad to engage the Taliban government in Kabul with an aim to gain easy access into Afghanistan. Chinese President Xi Jinping recently unveiled a grand plan of investing 3.8 billion USD for Central Asia's development, from building infrastructure to boosting trade. With its engagement in the region, China has put itself at the forefront of the race for political influence and energy assets in the resource-rich region, with Russia distracted by its war in the Ukraine and the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan diminishing the U.S. presence in the region. China's rise will bring new risks for the region, which India will need to remain vigilant and cognizant of. And time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Ships from the Coast Guard of the United States and Japan arrived in Manila this week for a week-long trilateral maritime exercise in the South China Sea with their Philippine counterpart. The first search maneuvers between them at a time of growing concern about China's moves in the region. Philippine Coast Guards waved small US and Japanese flags as the US CGC Stratton and Japan's patrol vessel Akitsushima docked at the pier. The June 1-7 exercise in waters off Bataan province was as initiative of the United States and Japan, while Australia would join as an observer, a Philippine Coast Guard official said earlier in the week. During the exercise, the Coast Guard of all three nations will conduct various activities focused on maritime law enforcement, maritime security and safety, search and rescue. Japan, Australia and the United States have frequently condemned China's militarization in the South China Sea and have sought to engage closer with the US ally, the Philippines, since Ferdinand Marcos Jr. took over as the president last year. Iraq launched a $17 billion project this week to link a major commodities port on its southern coast by rail and roads to the border with Turkey. In a move designed to transform the country's economy after decades of war and crisis, the development road aims to tie the Grand Four port in Iraq's oil-rich south to Turkey, turning the country into a transit hub by shortening travel time between Asia and Europe in a bid to rival the Suez Canal. Iraq's government envisions high-speed trains moving goods and passengers at up to 300 km per hour, links to local industry hubs and an energy component that could include oil and gas pipelines. It would mark a significant departure from the country's existing aged transport network. 
Iraq's train service currently operates a handful of lines, including slow oil freight and a single overnight passenger train that trundles from Baghdad to Basra, taking 10 to 12 hours to cover 500 kilometers. Passenger transport between Iraq and Europe harkens back to grand plans at the turn of the 20th century to create a Baghdad to Berlin Express. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership came into force for the Philippines on this week allowing the Southeast Asian country to participate in the world's biggest free trade agreement. The RCEP agreement was signed in November 2020. It went into force on January 1, 2022 for China and nine other countries. The rest of the signatories implemented the trade deal in the following months after ratification. The Philippines was the last country to ratify the FTA deal, which eases market access to countries including 10 ASEAN members, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand. Some Chinese companies that have business contact with the Philippine customers had already prepared to export their products as soon as the RCEP came into force. Moving on, Indian festivals are unique in their own ways. Their origin, celebration and message make them interesting to the celebrants. One such festival was held in Kunur, Tamil Nadu, which showcased a combination of fruits and art. A jewel nestled amidst the Nilgiri Hills, Kunur is a picturesque hill station in Tamil Nadu. The place is known for its lush green and misty environment. The month-long summer festival in Kunur culminated with a fruit festival. More than 50 types of fruits were displayed attractively in this fruit event. A giant pineapple made of 1.2 tons of pineapple was the main attraction of the show. The fresh, juicy fruits were arranged in such a way that the people who came to witness the event were mesmerized. The berries were arranged artistically and were given the name of Malabar Squirrel. I am seeing this fruit, beautiful fruit festival here and we are witnessing, as a kid I've always wondered how Spongebob lives in a pineapple house and that's like, it can be seen here in the pineapple house made out of pineapples, actual pineapples and there's a Malabar Squirrel which is made out of grapes, it is really beautiful. A uh, very unique piece of art and then there's a fruit basket actually made out of fruits that's very peculiar, very beautiful and very aesthetic to see. The pyramid was made of fresh oranges. India is known for presenting varieties. Popular homegrown mangoes and their varieties including Imam Pasand, Malgova, Alfonza, Senthira, etc. were displayed to the audience. A variety of bananas and jackfruit were also exhibited. Festival and this fruit mela is really amazing. They have made a big pineapple out of pineapples, a pyramid of oranges, a fruit basket made of big fruits, and a squirrel made of grapes. And it is really beautiful. The climate is really great. It's the best experience you can have in this area. Amazing. A few days back, a rose show was organized in Uti to celebrate the summer festival. The event was a feast for the eyes of the spectators. The park visible in the scene was decked with over 80,000 rose petals. The main attraction of the event was a 30 feet tall Eiffel Tower model. The event has showcased the best of floral creations, realistic and contemporary floral creativity and artistry and encouraged budding artists through these stunning works of art. It's not just Halabaloo and Fava and Indian festivals. There are a few that are truly aimed at pleasing and fulfilling aesthetic components. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.
people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.